Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. How nice of you. I'm just thinking here, sitting here thinking about how, how much, what a great experience this is for me and my wife Margaret to be here and how uh, typical it is really uh, of, of Hightower. They, uh, here we've got uh, uh, a lot of good friends and a lot of you all are good friends of Hightower's and have been for a long time. Down home music, hey. hon honest food, yeah. serious uh, commitment, but never so serious that you can't laugh a little bit. All of that just sort of uh, epitomizes uh, Hightower to me. Uh, and I also want to uh, say it's good to be with his, what I think he is called nearly a lifelong co-conspirator, Susan DeMarco is around here. <laughs> I always said uh, Hightower is tough as a, as a badger. Uh, and Betsy Moon, we were talking last night, one time she, was, she used to work for Hightower, and she said that uh, she was doing a, an article on him, and she talked to his high school football coach. Um, imagine Hightower as a football <laughs> player. And she asked his coach, what, what kind of football player was he? And she said, the coach said, he, he was like a buzzsaw. It didn't matter how big they were or what was ahead of him, he went through them like a buzzsaw. <laughs> That's high tower. Fearless. Well, he got me involved in a lot of things, but one time he got me involved in uh, setting up uh, a, a folk life foundation. He wrote up the legislation uh, to place it in the, uh, in the Library of Congress. And uh, I held a hearings on it in a subcommittee I headed, but they were uh, very unusual kind of hearings. Hightower set this up, too. We went to uh, the old Rhymer Auditorium, the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville, and uh, we, instead of the sort of the formal hearing you think of with a congressional hearing, we had uh, a lot of these old-time uh, hillbilly stars, uh, people like Doc Watson and Uncle Dave Macon and, and String Bean, no amplification. They performed their good old uh, honest down-home music. It was a wonderful time. We went across afterwards, Hightower and I did, over to uh, Tootsie's Bar right there next to Rhymer Auditorium. And uh, it was very crowded. And, and uh, Hightower in those days had a little longer hair than he does now. <laughs> and uh, I, I noticed across uh, against a wall was a, a Marine in uniform, who kept eyeing Hightower, this great big guy, one of these white sidewall haircuts and so forth, and after a while he got up and I thought to myself, my God, he, he's coming over here. And he was, he just made a beeline for Hightower. Well, I try, kind of moved out. So, well, <laughs> a little bit. He, he bent over and said something to Hightower, and Hightower, Hightower never flinched when he came over. And Hightower said, uh, shook his head, no. And the Marine walked away. And I said to him, I said, what, what did I say to you? He said, you know where we could score something? <laughs> Committed. Hightower is a person that believes in, in people, people power, people before prophets, uh, and, and, and I think that that's the kind of message that we need a, a lot more of, and he's been working at it a good while, and I think to uh, great effect. Harry Truman said uh, in Washington, if you want a friend, get a dog. <laughs> but uh, luckily, much better than a dog, I had Hightower when I was... <laughs> When, when I was there, a great old Western painter said, uh, uh, Charlie Russell said, uh, uh, when I had nothing, I always had friends. And that's the way Hightower has been. If he's your friend, he's your friend for life. And he is a friend. Jim Hightower.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Fred Harris, what a joy uh, to be romping up and down the road uh, with him uh, over the years and uh, back together uh, here. Uh, it, I gotta tell you, it just makes me happier than a flea at a dog show to be standing up here <laughs> looking out at all you scruffy uh, populace, uh, you <laughs> truth seekers, longtime friends, as Fred says, and fellow agitators here in the center of enlightenment and erudition to wallow in the glorious uh, democratic spirit of populism. You know, for me, spending the day talking politics and culture, which we've been doing this afternoon, absorbing great uh, grassroots uh, music, which we're going to do more of, it's been my life ambition to open for the Austin Lounge Lizards. And <laughs> Might go on my tombstone, I don't know. <laughs> Enjoying these great, good local eats and Texas beer and wine, it's about as much fun as you can have with your clothes on. Let me put it to you like that. So, First off, I want to thank uh, the Texas State uh, University, this library, uh, and the fabulous uh, Whitliff uh, collections. This is a spectacular <laughs> jewel. These, uh, th these folks are really uh, uh, astonishing. Absolute joy to work with uh, Connie Todd, uh, who was the director when we first started working here. Steve Davis, uh, who's current uh, interim director, can't be with us tonight because he's up for an award uh, for his book on uh, J. Frank Dobie, and you have to be there to collect the prize, so <laughs> he kissed us off. Uh, and uh, all the wonderful uh, Whitliffians, as I call them, uh, <laughs> Starting, of course, uh, with the man at the center of it all, the center of the center, Bill Whitliff. Uh, you know, Oscar Wilde said, be yourself, everyone else is already taken. <laughs> <laughs> and that really sums up Bill Whitliff. You cannot be more yourself than Bill Whitliff has been and his uh, great career. Proud to know him. And, and the great uh, crew, Beverly Vondren, who was just up here. Amy Cochran, the events coordinator who pulled this thing uh, uh, together. Michelle Mil Miller, the... Uh, uh, such a good media person, she actually got an article about me in the American Statesman. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it reminds me of a, a, uh, a guy who owned a Waco radio station back when I was in politics, and, and a reporter later told me, a TV reporter there later told me that, uh, that, that he had come up and watched in a monitor some news thing that I was on, and he turned to this guy and he said, I never want to see that guy on my station again unless he has died. <laughs> so I'm trying to disappoint him as long as possible. Katie Salzman, the lead archivist, this is a great exhibit back here. Uh, Mary Garcia and Bianca Marshall, they spent more than a year inventorying, and preserving, and putting uh, that uh, load of trash that we delivered <laughs> here <laughs> into something that makes some sense uh, out there. And from my, uh, my, my own uh, little team at, uh, at Hightower and Associates, which is me and anybody who would associate with me, <laughs> and luckily there are two, Laura Ehrlich in the back of the room and Mel Melody Bird right up here in front. They do tremendous work. And to uh, Suzanne Perkins uh, and the Cool Mint Cafe, I hope you got a few of those edibles back there. Pretty tasty things, huh? And the St. Arnold's Brewery as well. Yo, yeah. Oh, yeah. I believe in uh, lubricating the movement. <laughs> and so we thank the uh, Cool Mint Cafe also for getting the Texas wines. Uh, well, first off, uh, it's just a, a joy uh, for me to be here, and I thank the Whitliff uh, Collections uh, for their enthusiasm in making this happen, but uh, more importantly, uh, for their willingness to make this a festival uh, and, and to, to make this day about something larger uh, than just one personality, as handsome as that personality might be. <laughs> so hence this... Uh, living spirit of Texas populism uh, that we're hosting here today. Uh, the need to address the solid principles of American populism has been building in me since the media started sticking the populist label on Sarah Palin, Rick Perry, and Glenn Beck, and Rush Limbaugh. 
I mean, it's like putting earrings on a hog. You just can't hide the ugliness. <laughs> It is down under. You can call them populists. But these are not populists. They are corporatists, mouthpieces, and fronts for the corporate powers that real populists exist to fight. That's what populism really is all about. So a year ago, I felt the need to revisit the true and proud history of the populist movement in our country, which, by the by, began out here in Lampasas County in 1877. Uh, populism sprang from this very state and this great soil and it built all up the plains and then across the upper Midwest and then down through the south and then it went coast to coast. New York had populace. California had populace all across. So I, I won't tax your patience with, with the history of it all. Uh, that we've got a copy, I think, of my Hightower Lowdown, if not there, around here uh, back in uh, last May uh, titled Populism is Not a Style, It's a People's Rebellion Against Corporate Power. Uh, so it is something real. It's not something you can just appropriate uh, for uh, yourself. Uh, today's program and the exhibit back behind us here uh, really are a continuation of this effort uh, to remind and to reclaim populism. There is a history, spirit, integrity, and power in the word. Bob Moser, the Texas Observer, just did a tremendous piece uh, talking exactly about that. There's power in the word, and that is why the corporatists and the right-wingers are trying to steal it from us. They use and abuse the word, but they don't begin to comprehend it. Uh, when it comes to grasping the real concept of populism, the Perrys and the Palins are as confused as goats on AstroTurf. I mean, <laughs> a... So we've used this exhibit in my archive to try to portray populism as it has been experienced in one life, uh, mine. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a brief gallop. Uh, through my life. Uh, I grew up as a populist uh, in Denison, Texas, uh, right on the Oklahoma border, across from Fred there. We were the first line of defense against the Okies, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up a populist, but I did not know it. It wasn't taught in the schools. We didn't know the word at all, even though it had Mm, about 50 years before, been a very prominent political movement in that area of, of our state. But its spirit and its essence uh, was all around me. In the music that I grew up with, rock and roll, uh, black blues, working man blues, uh, the uh, uh, bluegrass music, uh, country music, of course. Uh, it was around me in terms of the church. Uh, many a sermon began with uh, the likelihood of a rich man going to heaven is like the... Uh, that camel going through the eye of a needle. Uh, it was present in the people I grew up with, and particularly in my family. I uh, wrote a book uh, that had a chapter called Daddy's Philosophy. Have to beware of Texans telling daddy stories. You know? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I had a pretty good one. And uh, he didn't know he had a philosophy. <laughs> and he certainly would have been embarrassed to have been told that he did. Uh, he thought he was a conservative. If, if a poster had gone to 1331 West Hall Street and Denison knocked on the door, are you a liberal or conservative? He said, oh, put me down a conservative. But if you talk to him about what the bank holding companies were doing to small businesses like his, if you talk to him about uh, what, uh, what the chain stores and ultimately Walmart were doing to squeeze people like him out of Main Street, if you talk to him about uh, what the uh, lobbyists down in uh, Austin were doing to control the government, then he was not a conservative at all. He was a, uh, a, a prairie radical, a populist. Uh, his philosophy came down to this, the notion of the common good. We're all in this together. He grew up in the Depression, uh, came of age, and was able to start a small business with my mother, who still lives right down the road here in Cibolo, uh, with my brother Larry, 94 years of age, and still cooking. Uh, and they were able to create a little middle-class way of life for my two brothers and myself and uh, got me through college, first one in my family to go through college. Uh, but he didn't think he did that by himself. He didn't think he's some sort of raw individual Superman who did that. He knew there was this larger community out there uh, and that that gave support to him and he had to give support back to it. And he expressed this philosophy to me periodically in these words. He said, Jim, everybody does better when everybody does better. That's what passes for political philosophy in Denison, Texas. 
It's as good a one as I ever heard because that's the opposite of what they're now pursuing. They're saying, we can take care of our good fortunes and not worry about the well-being of the many. We don't care about everybody. We care about us. Well, that's not America, and that damn sure is not populism. Well, then I went to school up at the University of North Texas and had a history course, just basic American history, book written by T. Harry Williams, late, later did the ultimate book on uh, Huey Long. Uh, and it had chapter on populism. And I went through that and I said, that's me. That's my father. That's my family. That's everybody I grew up with. That's what they're talking about. Populism gradually and naturally then became uh, my work. And I've been blessed to learn from some of the best of them. I worked for Ralph Yarborough in the United States Senate. Uh, Ralph didn't call himself a populist, but he was. Uh, he was an unabashed, unrelenting battler of the powers that be on behalf of the powers that ought to be, the ordinary workaday people. He stood up for them. He passed legislation uh, like very few have done uh, in our history in a very short period of time in the Senate. He created the Big Thicket National Park, created the Big Bend National Park, Padre Island National Seashore. All of that came from Ralph Yarbrough. More educational legislation than any single senator ever in history came through Ralph Yarbrough's committee. Uh, and, and, and he was a battler of those powerful interests on behalf of the rest of us. And he would say, we need to put the jam on the lower shelf so the little people can reach it too. You know, uh, That was the spirit of it. And he taught me that you can run on principles, on good, solid, working class principles, and win. And you can then also lose on those principles. <laughs> <laughs> and that that's okay because you mattered. You actually stood for something. And it made a difference. And I moved on in into, as Fred was indicating, the Agribusiness Accountability uh, Project, a mouthful of words there uh, that Susan DeMarco and I uh, created, uh, confronting the corporate control of America's food economy. That was in 1970, 71, before it became fashionable. Uh, and uh, Susan and I wrote a book called Hard Tomatoes, Hard Times. And this book was about uh, the title of the book came, it was about the land-grant college system, uh, Texas A&M, the extension service, and how it became co-opted uh, by corporate interests and in working against the, the common interests. Uh, and Hard Tomatoes, Hard Times came from the fact that Del Monte Corporation uh, in California had gotten the University of California at Davis, the land-grant college there, to uh, build them a tomato harvesting machine because they didn't like farm workers. Uh, so they wanted to harvest mechanically. And so UC Davis, with our tax money, dutifully did it. Uh, but then there was a problem with the machine because it crushed the tomatoes. <laughs> it was not a sensitive machine. And uh, so that was no problem though because they then got UC Davis and the University of Florida to create a tomato that would not be crushed by the machine. And that's where that hard little nugget that was in the cellophane packages uh, came from, the hard tomatoes. And the hard times came from the fact that that machine, upon introduction within uh, just a couple of years, uh, put 5,000 California tomato growers out of business, put thousands of uh, farm workers uh, yeah, out, out of work. In Hawaii as well, all, right, all, all across, exactly right. And that's the power that they use. Well, in doing this book, DeMarco was doing the research, and she was this little petite thing, and she'd go into the U.S. Department of Agriculture and just be so innocent and say, well, tell me what you're doing. You know, what is this about, this, this machine here and these tomatoes? And she was talking to one USDA official there, and. She, and, and about the domain, and he was the official knew about this uh, uncrushable uh, tomato. And, she's, and he was bragging about how wonderful this was. And she said, well, yes, but uh, you know, these off-season uh, supermarket tomatoes that she had tried had no taste. Uh, and other than actual shape, uh, they bore no relationship <laughs> to the actual tomato she'd grown up with in New Jersey, which was a major tomato producing area. <laughs> And he leaned into her and he said, your children will never know the difference. <laughs> well, that's when we knew uh, we had them. Uh, because, <laughs> because we knew uh, that a coalition of farmers, farm workers, consumers, uh, environmentalists, uh, nutritionists, and et cetera, uh, were not going to take this uh, for the long haul. More on that in a minute. Then I moved on. Uh, into uh, working with Fred Harris, uh, who uh, had uh, been carrying uh, a number of the issues uh, that we 
uh, worked on in the agribusiness project and elsewhere. Uh, he not only get, got it, but he was willing to act on it. Uh, and, uh, and I later ended up in 76 being his uh, campaign coordinator for uh, President of the United States, uh, making Fred what he is today, <laughs> professor in Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico. But, <laughs> But I learned three important lessons from Fred, and that is one, the power of storytelling. You need to be able to tell a story. Uh, too often we get, a, get involved in facts and uh, uh, details uh, and, and, and lose the bigger story that communicates with people. My friend Van Jones uh, uh, pointed out to, to me that liberals too often you know, do get lost in facts. Uh, and they, they mistake the bigger story. He points out that Martin Luther King Jr. did not say, I have a position paper. <laughs> I have a dream. So the power of storytelling, and then also the power of fun. You just got to enjoy this stuff. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, uh, it, politics is a, is, is a gruesome exercise and an unnatural experience, I got to tell you, <laughs> to run for office. But, uh, but you've got to make it fun. You've got to unleash the fun uh, that is actually in front of you. Uh, and then I learned another thing, and that is something Fred always said, you can't have a mass movement without the masses. <laughs> Seems kind of commonsensical, but we as liberals and progressives up in Washington had forgotten that. I was still in Washington, D.C. I spent 10 years up there. Uh, and we were very serious about passing legislation and demanding that Congress do this and that and the president do it. Uh, but, but we had no real power because we were using the power of senators who were already there. We weren't connected back to the grassroots, which is where our power actually uh, is. Power does not come from Washington, it comes from outside, out here, in places like right here in uh, San Marcos in Central Texas, generally. Uh, and you've got to rally that power to bring it inside. Uh, again, growing up in Denison, Texas, I was a small guy, but I, so I learned early on, you should never hit a man with glasses. You should use something much heavier. <laughs> <laughs> And the heavy weight that we have is that power of the people. And then I came back uh, uh, to Texas. Uh, after much to us, our astonishment, Fred did not win the presidency. Uh, and, uh, and took over from Molly Ivins as, and Kate Northcott as editor of the, uh, of the Texas Observer. And in my very first column uh, of my uh, Observer, I said, you're in for a heavy dose of populism right at the top. The central fact of economic and political power in Texas is that too few people control all the money and power, leaving the rest of us with very little of either. That boils down to corporate power, and it begs for journalistic attention. Uh, this was not being reported at the time uh, in Texas, 1977, 78, 79. The proper symbol of Texas today is not the armadillo, the blue bonnet, or the pickup truck, but the pharaonic steel and glass corporate headquarters that dominate our lives as surely as they dominate the skylines of our major cities. Uh, and so we did that for two and a half years uh, at the Observer, reporting on bank holding companies, uh, reporting on the, the uh, evolving farm tractorcade movement. Uh, weren't getting press anywhere else, so we covered them. People who did not think that they were liberals either, did not think that they were progressives, thought they were conservative, but in fact they were populist and willing to rebel against this agribusiness middleman power that was crushing them and the bank power charging outrageous interest rates that was crushing them. And so did that for two and a half years and then wrote my last column, uh, which concluded sometimes writing about the bastards is not enough. <laughs> and so I then made the only downward career move you can make from journalism, which was to go into politics. <laughs> uh, ran an all out uh, populist uh, campaign and much to the amusement of the people of Texas, uh, ended up winning. Uh, and then uh, the real uh, work began. Can you govern as a populist? We did put a populist coalition together, farmers, workers, uh, labor unions, uh, environmentalists, consumers, et cetera, rural, urban. We made it. We got there. But then what are you going to do? Uh, and sure enough, as soon as I got elected, uh, these lobbyists started coming up to me, and one of them particularly was lobbyists of the Farm Bureau, uh, which despite the name farm, has nothing to do with farm at all. It's an insurance and chemical conglomerate. Uh, its biggest membership in Texas, for example, is in Houston. <laughs> Give you a clue. Uh, <laughs> So this lobbyist came up, and he was a particularly smarmy guy, and he said, well, I tell you, all right, you got elected 
But if you'll just move over to the middle of the road, we'll get along. And so that afternoon, in fact, uh, farmer friends of mine from out in the Panhandle were in to visit. Uh, and I told him about this guy's visit. And this one, he said, hi, Tower. Uh, don't worry about that. Said there's nothing in the middle of the road but yellow stripes and dead armadillos. <laughs> you know, you need to get over here with your friends and and let's do something together. And so we did. Uh, and one of the best things we did was to foster what I call uh, the upchuck rebellion. Uh, <laughs> uh, Demarco and I, our latest book, "Swim Against the Current: Even the Dead Fish Can Go with the Flow." Uh, we specialize in titles. <laughs> The, what, what this Upchuck Rebellion was, and bear in mind, we're, we're again back in the early and mid-1980s. Uh, it was a grassroots, uh, truly populist uh, creation of a viable alternative uh, to the industrialized, conglomeratized, and globalized food economy literally being shoved down our throats. Uh, by corporate agribusiness and their puppets uh, in government. And so we tried to do a different thing. And we brought people with different skills in to the Department of Agriculture and turned them loose. I said to them, I used a Franklin Roosevelt phrase in 1933. Franklin Roosevelt took office and he said, do something. If it works, do it some more. If it doesn't work, do something else. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my advice. <laughs> and luckily we had smart people, DeMarco, headed uh, the, uh, she was assistant commissioner for marketing and uh, agriculture development. And we launched these marketing initiatives.